Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Michael. Michael, for everyone out there listening, please introduce yourself to us. Hi, my name is Michael Gordon. I'm a historian of science based at Princeton University, um, and I work on a bunch of different topics, but uh, one of my particular interests is pseudoscience as a category. Okay, so pseudoscience. It seems like that I see that I've been diving down that rabbit hole of pseudoscience only because it seems like people can use that term, but I don't fully know what it means. Now we talk about a science that isn't really generally publicly accepted. It's more like kind of like I would say what people would probably call controversy or conspiracies. Yeah. So uh, I don't care for the term pseudoscience either because basically nobody would admit to adhering to it, right? Like no one who believes a controversial doctrine or a discredited doctrine thinks that what they are doing is somehow pseudo. They think that they are doing science. They're investigating nature. And if the establishment or the mainstream doesn't accept that, um, that's the establishment's problem, not theirs. The uh, pseudoscience is a lot like the word heresy in, for religions. It's something that you always ascribe to your opponent. It's not anything anybody would ever adopt for themselves. And so I would treat that term gingerly. I just think it's interesting that sometimes religions do call other people heretical. And sometimes they do, scientists do pick out people and say that is not just wrong science. That's not just mistaken or outdated that's pseudoscience. And escalating the rhetoric that way seems to me um, important to pay attention to. Have you come across anything that you felt was pseudoscience, like labeled the term that you could use? Like if I gave you the word pseudoscience, first thing that comes to your mind? Um, so this, I, I, what I can tell you is uh, what people, what scientists in particular, but other people consider canonical pseudosciences. I usually call these things fringe. Uh, fringe science because that represents themselves being on the outside. If you want to think of what canonical pseudosciences are, that is what people who like the term would call those things, I would say astrology is very high up there. Um, phrenology, the science of bumps on the head. Um, and then you get into other territories. Many people consider research into extrasensory perception, ESP, to be like that. Another category that's often invoked is the general term is cryptozoology, meaning the zoology of the hidden, but that's things like the Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, Bigfoot the Yeti, Jersey Devil, Kraken. There's a, there's a bunch of these. Um, there are other variants too. Uh, eugenics is very frequently framed as a pseudoscience, and most people today would not call themselves eugenicists. That term has garnered opprobrium around it. Like People just don't like the term because that term is associated with a pseudoscience. But many of the doctrines and beliefs that are associated with it are in fact embraced by plenty of mainstream people at different times. So there's a spectrum of different doctrines. And one of the reasons I don't like the term pseudoscience is it lumps together all of this stuff that's actually pretty distinct. Um, they have different histories, they have different philosophical claims, they have different assumptions about what science is. And so they're all somehow cordoned off from each other intellectually, but lumping them together like pseudoscience makes them seem like they're the same thing. And I don't think they quite are. It seems like, yeah, because pseudos, because when I, I was on Wikipedia and it's probably not the best pl place to get info, but it's an interesting place if you want to look up what pseudoscience is and then the categories that they put in pseudoscience, they put something in there like a conversational model was pseudoscience. And it was the, mm -hmm. the aspect of conversation enlightening doorways to make connections on a broader scale between people. And I'm like, well, I'm the best evidence. I've had over a thousand episodes, each one an individual conversation. <laughs> I was like, what? It's about learning perspective. 
objectives, but I guess it was labeled as a pseudoscience because it wasn't like, I guess, effectively tested out. But I was like, you just examine a well-known speaker. But then even then, if you talk about a speaker, are they speaking down to the public or is it more of a one-on-one -on -one thing? I don't think anybody wants to take the time to have individual conversations. I'm crazy. Um, so <laughs> I'm more than willing to do so. Uh, but fringe theories as well, too. I like the term fringe theory because it sounds like it just hasn't been given enough time. And there are some ones out there that I honestly think could probably get a second go at it. But even with AI tech or the AI development, the rapid growth of that, robotics, um, ethnoborgs, all these things that are labeled under pseudoscience, they all start seeming like really, really like, I mean, close capabilities that we could be, I guess, possibly be living in sooner or later. So uh, this is uh, one of the reasons I like the word fringe too, is because it just implies outskirts. And you're absolutely right that sometimes uh, things that are on the fringe can move towards the center, whether because of technological change or new data or changes in perspective. Uh, let me give you uh, an example, like two examples of that from like hardcore physics. And the, the AI stuff is actually a good example of more recently than now. And then I'm going to give you an example the other way, because I think that that's important too. Because um, one example, in the late 19th century, when people are doing physics, basically to be a physicist, you have to assume that light waves travel on some sort of medium. And that medium is the ether. They hadn't been able to detect it, but it had to be there because water waves go on water, sound waves travel through air. There must be a medium. Uh, 19, in 1905, Albert Einstein's special relativity theory says, you know, our physics is the same whether or not this thing exists. So why don't we just toss out the ether and just carry on with the physics otherwise? And that view is extremely fringy when it's first suggested and then very widely accepted. So the place where innovation comes from is the edge. Uh, string theory was an extremely marginal theory in the 1970s. And by the 1990s was a dominant form of doing uh, theoretical physics. Still controversial, but it's not pseudo, whatever that would be. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there are theories that start out in the middle and then move out. And so your, your comments are very future-oriented, like robotics, AI, and that is definitely a way of thinking of the fringe as generating new ideas. But it's also a place where things that have been exiled from the consensus go. I, I should have said the classic example of creationism people usually mention is creationism, the idea that the earth was created in six literal days, uh, 6,000 years ago. That was a very mainstream scientific hypothesis in the 18th century and early 19th century. It was part of science was like, that's how we got the species we got. Now, how do we explain these things that don't seem to fit with that? By the end of the 19th century, that's no longer considered a scientific position. It's considered a religious one. Um, so that's a, the, but creationism lives on and it lives on, on the edge. So sometimes things come from the edge and move towards the center. Other times things start in the center and move out towards the edge. Um, and so I, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't endorse the idea that the fringe is always full of potential good ideas. It's also, it's just full of ideas, yeah. some of which are good and some of which are bad. Um, which ones we accept in are sometimes for good reasons really good data, confirmed, uh, reliable knowledge. And sometimes they're rejected because of biases or oversights or petty personality differences. And uh, it's hard in the mix of it to detect which one of those is actually going on. Yeah, I've been talking to a couple of friends now who studied the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, and that gets labeled as a pseudoscience or a fringe theory. But even that those category um, on Wikipedia, it's completely different. You won't get the same results if you look under fringe theory compared to pseudoscience. But if I was going to pick something that we do have as science that I would consider probably a pseudoscience type thing, I mean, philosophy I'm not saying it's not needed. I definitely think it's essential because I, some of the things that people can say and speak and the words that they use, the thoughts that they form, it's very, very impactful. And it's definitely a mood booster. But it gets for me, that's like you could put that under psychology in a sense as well, too. But philosophy, like everybody on Twitter seems like a philosopher or at least has it in their bio, that or stand up comedian. And um, it just seems like you're we're celebrating your growth as an individual 
but I don't know if that really classifies as a scientific field of study. Like, how do you study the scientific realm of thought or consciousness besides digging into your brain? But just reading a bunch of books seems like a weird type of thing. I don't know. Well, I, I, I think that uh, some of what you're reacting to, and I think this is totally appropriate, is that the, the word science is uh, flexible and hasn't had the same definition over time. And it's very hard to define even now. But for many centuries, philosophy was not just in science, it was kind of science. Um, before the term science was generally used for talking about things like physics or biology, the two terms that were most broadly discussed are natural philosophy and natural history. Natural history is like history, but just of plants and animals. And natural philosophy is an attempt to try and understand causes. And so it's like philosophy, it's just the part that has to do with nature. We now call that stuff science. But in that same period, the most distinguished form of systematic knowledge, reliable knowledge, most prestigious, most reliable was theology. You know that there are angels, you know that, the, that God has certain properties. So what do we get by investigating those properties rationally? And that was considered highly scientific. We no longer do that. So uh, things that were once considered scientific are no longer, and other things that were not considered scientific at all, like, um, I mean, in some sense, studying uh, dreams or hallucinations was considered, those things are just freaks. Uh, you just can't analyze them scientifically, are now considered things that psychologists can study. Um, so the boundary between science and non-science is, uh, is highly mobile over time. Uh, and uh, if we get stuck on science is just this definition, we end up freezing a particular picture of science for too long instead of um, having a more capacious understanding of how flexible things have been historically and probably will continue to be in the future. Would you say that the boundary of what can be classified under pseudoscience or what could possibly be taken out of it is movable? Like if you evolve past a certain thing, like for instance, if everyone turns into a computer and there's no need to have like really full on emotions, just speaking hypothetically, obviously. Um, but if that happens, then would we need for philosophy, will we need for certain psychology analysis if we're all data chips in a sense that could be pushed out? Or is that something that's so, because I feel like with biology or with certain characteristics, that have literally made a giant impact in how human or human evolution has really progressed, then that can't be pushed out. But something that could be like on the line of like, well, that's it's technically like, like depending on who you talk to, whatever degree you have, people will look at you as such depending on what a degree they have. So it's like mm -hmm. if you have an uh, bringing it back to astrology, if you have an astrology degree or some type of degree that f focuses in that field, study of stars or whatever then an astrophysicist is going to look at you like that's not even a real field. So I'm wondering if there's things that can be thrown back into the actual category of science and things that can be pushed out. It seems like it's like a blob. It just moves and absorbs. Yeah, it, it, it's, it is a blob and it moves and absorbs and it shrinks and it expands. It's, it doesn't do that willy nilly, just arbitrarily. It does that in response to various social and cultural transformations, technological change. Computer science was, of course, not a field before there were computers. Like, just, like there was no such field, now there is. Um, and uh, even though one can imagine that one could have done that stuff using mathematics, uh, people didn't until a certain technology gave people an opportunity to reflect differently on certain processes. Public health only makes sense if people live in communities. Um, like where diseases can spread in certain ways and societies have certain norms. If we were uploaded into a computer, public health would cease to be a thing, right? Because there would be no public to have a health. Unless you have a virus. Um, a computer virus, then you would have something else that would be, we would redefine what that is. Um, but the, so the boundaries of what counts, so theology is no longer a science, other things certainly are that move into the space. And um, it, one of the things historians of science do is track that. So how has this emerged over time? How do you end up with fields like biochemistry, which at first it's not obvious what that thing is. And then over time, chemists and biologists come to create this border area and say like, well, that thing looks a little different from who we are and it fissions off and becomes its own thing.
So different fields definitely grow and shrink over time. It's one of the things about science that I generally, as a historian of science, wish people understood more broadly is that science isn't static. It's a highly dynamic process. And as a result, it you it's not possible to make sort of blanket statements about it is this or it is not that. You have to notice when you're saying that and for what reasons are those claims based upon. And well, science yeah. is kind of like a counterintuitive topic. It's like nothing's really definitive in a sense because it can always evolve, but also science yep. is based in evidence. So it's also like bringing evidence to the table to show what you have now. I think there's mm -hmm. a large misunderstanding with the public when it comes to science in general. And with talking with so many, I've started to get a good grasp on it. It's like, oh, we think of science as like a clear all label that it's this, and this is a hundred percent the facts. And it's like, well, you got to understand is the best part about science is that it's never really finished. It's kind of like Leonardo da Vinci's quote, which is art is never uh, finished, just left undone because he always believed you could add something onto it, whether it was the next day or the next hour for so on. Um, I'm just curious. Do you think society has that much of an impact to be able to cancel out something? Like, for instance, I had a, a guest on uh, Elizabeth Weiss, who is an anthropologist, and she's studying Native American bones. But now she's being uh, attacked by uh, society. Her institution is so afraid of society's opinions and views that they lock the doors on her. And now she's suing her university because she's literally being deflamed all because she took a picture with um, uh, a, a skull saying after the pandemic, she was so happy to be back in the lab. And I wonder, like, I've heard so many stories about cancel culture, and I've heard anthropologists speak about it. I've heard so many things. I wonder if society could literally have that much of an impact. It seems like if you're going to label things as this is actual science and this is pseudoscience or fringe theory, then it leaks into this thing of like, when does the polling start to switch when people decide what goes in and what goes out on the basis of what society believes in? Like try even mentioning gender studies. Like I had Lee McIntyre on the show and we're talking about the evidence in science and what a science is like, I guess, about like what you can really do. Like if a, he, his example was if you brought a um, mother, a mother was in a hospital with her child who's underage. It's the doctor's ethical choice and scientific, I guess, job to really you know work with that patient and they're like what happens if it's religious and next thing you know you can't transfer blood or something like that well you got to use the evidence that they have and say this is what you need to do because this is what's going to be best for your child and i go the only time you won't ever see that type of enforcement from a scientist or a doctor is if it happens to do with hormonal treatments and then it's true though, because that's a weird topic. Even bringing it up, you feel like you got to like whisper a little bit because gender studies, anything of that sort, society has a certain preference against the evidence of whatever anthropology or whoever is talking about doing that science. So it gets to this point of like, does that mean like if you get enough people like Bigfoot hunters out there, we could have a whole army of people just force big Bigfoot or cryptozoology into actual science? So I think a couple things about that. I wanted to just, okay. just uh, I'll pick a couple I strands of it because <laughs> no, there's just a lot of things in there. So the, the science about gender and hormones and identity and neurology is uh, very rapidly changing. And so it's very hard to freeze uh, any particular claim at any point in time. It's just, it's still disputed. Um, and that's normal for science. The problem, the place where that butts up against something, and this is the main thing I want to say is when it comes to policy. Um, policy is different, right? You have the most, one of the most important features about science that I just think it's important to stress is science is pretty expensive. Um, if you want to do scientific research, you need to pay for it and it costs. That's a, that makes it a public question of what we choose to fund and what we don't choose to fund. So this is a, a separate, it's a separate question from the pseudoscience question, but it's a related point about what societies decide is worth funding and what societies decide is worth not funding or supporting. So human cloning research is banned in the United States. Um, that's a choice made, an ethical choice. It's not a scientific choice. It's a political choice made. But there are reasons why you and I might agree with that particular choice. Like maybe, maybe we shouldn't be doing that quite now. Um, maybe not. Um, there are other things like it's illegal to use federal money to investigate guns as though they are a public health problem. You can't do it. That's uh, this federal law saying that's not possible. I need to make some so, phone calls. 
Yeah. So, so <laughs> if you want to investigate, like if you want to say, like, if we had another technology that entered into a community and caused these kinds of deaths, we would treat it like a public health crisis. But we are not allowed to use federal funds to do that research. You have to use private funds or not do the research. So we, we do these regulations all the time. Uh, it's been decided on multiple uh, judiciary levels that you can't teach creationism in public schools as though it is science. So we make these calls regularly as a society, in part because we have limited resources and limited time, and we have to make decisions balancing various different sensibilities. There's nothing intrinsically pathological about that. It's kind of inevitable. There are cases, and there's like a fam famous Nazi related cases and famous Stalinist related cases where there are attempts to impose a particular doctrine as this is the truth. This is the scientific truth. This is a truth about nature that the state is telling you is correct. Those have been tried. They've always failed. So the long run success of those ventures is, is not promising, but that doesn't mean people won't try. And again, even in non-authoritarian or totalitarian systems, you end up with having to make choices about what's a legitimate form of inquiry and what's not. And that that's a view that um, it's kind of hard to argue against if you're asking for public support for um, domain of inquiry X, like um, human space travel. Like you're asking for a lot of money for that you have to be able, you have to be willing to accept that that comes with some regulation and some control and some oversight. What about remote viewing? Like that was a government, like you ever see the movie Men Who Stare at Goats? That, yeah. was, a, that was a government project, but it wasn't the yep. government face out fronting saying we're paying for this. They actually developed a small private little company that insourced mm -hmm. into that. So, I mean, it's like a, a work around the system. If they can't publicly fund, then we can just own a private company and that private company, we give them the money then they give it to them. It's not us, mm -hmm. but I mean, that's labeled as pseudoscience. And then next thing right. you know, the Obama used three people using remote viewing to find Osama bin Laden. They helped not, well, I'm not saying I don't that's, know. I, that, I don't know if that's true. That is I, that, true. that I would I hey, did. A, I did. An, that's I did how a they found him. No, no, no. That, that's that's, they... that's he. It was just they were just incorporated. He actually did that. That's not saying that's how they found them. But... Oh, 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 okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. That's the part I was questioning. Um, so, uh, in general, uh, so this has happened multiple times. The Soviet Union invested in the idea of remote viewing espionage as well. It was, and uh, there was at my institution for many years a lab that investigated whether people could change machines with their minds. And that was supported by McDonnell of McDonnell Douglas Aircraft on the grounds of, look, it's a couple hundred thousand dollars. It's not very expensive. And if it's true, it would be a big deal. And like remote viewing is similar. It's like on the scale of what military scientific research is, a couple hundred thousand dollars is not really money. Um, and so if you can uh, pay a couple of remote viewers, just see maybe in the same way that uh, police officers in serial killer cases sometimes talk to psychics. Like, can't hurt, and maybe it'll help. Um, and that, I think, is a th th that is a phenomenon you see where basically it's in places where people are both desperate and can afford the 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 low price tag that you see fringe stuff getting incorporated into. Um, more establishment grants. So NASA has funded some very, very weird stuff on the grounds of, well, if we wanna make things, if we wanna have better propulsion on rockets, we have, the, we have the ways we know we can do that and we can see the limits of those. What if we gave weird blue sky grants to like people who are way out there and see what they could come up with? Chances are nothing, but if they come up with something, it'll be big. And so that's also part of science funding is that it's a risk taking uh, cost benefit analysis. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying is like, that's what's got me so interested in the pseudoscience thing, because if remote viewing is labeled pseudoscience, but then you find out Obama did hire people to do that, not saying that they found them. I'm just saying they hired them to help. So I go, what is this? Like your, your, your face is you're telling me that you, this is a pseudoscience, but then behind the curtain, you're working with these people. It's kind of like UFOlogy or UFOlogist. Yeah. That's a yeah. pseudoscience, but there's they got the NASA director saying they're looking into aliens. So what do they do? Just change the name? So I'm just like oh, this. This oh. is why Fringe is just such a better name uh, because it doesn't have this um, 
the, the pseudoscience thing has a kind of on off switch quality. Like you either are or you're not. And well, it's there like are other practice, things where we like don't know. science. It's like if cryptozoology, if you say Bigfoot is pseudoscience, that's pseudoscience. I would not call that a fringe theory because fringe theory makes it sound closer to the mark of being a real thing. Well, except, so for a long time, it was generally understood that giant squids don't exist, that those are mythical things. They do. We found one. Like, right, all it takes to actually find the Loch Ness Monster is to see it. Like, if we actually get a credible sighting, we'd be like, okay, I guess that thing exists. It actually doesn't change science much if Bigfoot was real, right? Like, we'd be like, oh, there's a Bigfoot. Unless he's linked to climate change. And then, like, (laughs) like we'd be like, oh, look at that. There's a Bigfoot. Now we have a Bigfoot. Uh, That's another animal. The the coelacanth is a fish. uh, fish. um, What? Dino fish. There's a documentary on that. Yeah, no, no. We we thought they were extinct. And then all of a sudden, it turns out they're not. Um, So, uh, so in in the case of remote as long as you say fringe like it's like it's out there on the borderlands some of the stuff on the borderlands probably most of the stuff on the borderlands is going to go nowhere but uh some of it might become credible but the if uh esp was to, found to be valid it would radically transform most of what we think we know about physics and psychology if we found bigfoot we would slightly revise our sense of human evolution, uh, but only slightly. Uh, it, so there are different scales of how disruptive some of these fringe claims are. Have you ever tried, like, up? The, I wouldn't say have you ever tried, but up, have you ever looked through and just the, the pseudoscience category or even fringe category and be like, I don't understand. This is obviously it's scientific. It seems like sometimes they just don't update. Or they sometimes just Mm -hmm. don't really translate over because maybe someone's not paying attention to that type of thing. Like animal communication or animal magnetism, Mm -hmm. those are like fringe theories. Those are just way off base because we don't have, it seems like nobody's just put the funding into it. But I go, I bet you if you put enough funding into something like that, you can probably find some type of connection. I mean, we didn't know uh, animals really had emotions until, what was it like? I forgot what year it was, but it wasn't that long ago. Yeah, but, but like, like there are like, that's actually an area, animal communication, animal emotions, all these areas where those ideas were fringy and now they're not. They're like, they're much closer into the mainstream of how we understand animal behavior now. Um, and some of that's people hadn't invested resources in it, but you end up with many people not understanding that there's been a change. So, um, and this, a, a lot of the problems that come with classifying or not classifying various sciences, this or that, come from uh, the general public's, I think, misapprehension about the static quality of science. So they think that what they learned when they were in elementary and middle school is true. Like what they were told in science classes is a set of truths that are unchangeable. And what science will do later is just add on new truths to the, what they already know. Not that things that they learned are revisable because we get new data or we change our interpretation. Classic example of this is Pluto ceasing to be a planet. That's the word planet is used by astronomers to define a certain set of objects. Turns out it was more useful to define that set of objects in such a way that Pluto doesn't fit in it. Uh, But people felt betrayed as though something that they they knew was true is no longer true. But the example I like the most is dinosaurs and feathers. Um, so many sets of dinosaurs had feathers. They weren't scaly lizards like iguanas. They were proto birds. Um, that is very hard for people to accept when they remember that they had toys that were dinosaurs that looked a certain way. And the Jurassic Park movies have sort of... Uh, finagled their way past this yeah it's Um, it's good on spielberg but it really messed with a lot of people's heads yeah (laughs) Uh, but that is um that that's a case where someone's like but i learned this i learned that this was true and you're like we really thought it was true 20 years ago but we have better data and this is why we think this new thing understanding that science is dynamic in that way and revisable and that many of the things that are published in journals this year will be found to be refuted in a few years later that's um, not just is that ordinary, it's actually the point. We want science to do that. Um, but it, 
makes people uncomfortable fairly understandably. They want to know what's reliable and what's not reliable. And the best, one of the best tools we have is this thing called science, but it has as a consequence of it, its ability to revise everything. And that's, that's a little uh, upsetting. Do you um, think with just the whole topic in general, do you find that it's a lot of the issues that go on with the institutions? Like, it just seems like there's a lot of things I've learned about pseudoscience or fringe theories where I'm like, I bet if this was just given like the actual proper time and the actual consultation into this type of thing. But it felt like for so long, especially with talking to so ac so many academics, that a lot of the times it's about the study that goes up. And sometimes it's interesting for the person reading it to want to fund it. And also times it just gets rejected where I go, well, then it's like dismissing like uh, the younger driest impact hypothesis. That's now being looked at too as like that's we rejected that too early. I had James Powell on the show to talk mm -hmm. about like it was just rejected too early. There's plenty of evidence, but it just wasn't given the time. And it seems like a conflict of emotions within science itself where I start. I sh should we have a contesting thing from maybe a general public in a sense to be able to debate and see if it's science? Uh, it's it's uh, I'm not, uh, I, I think that uh, it's important to recognize that scientists are people too. And so they have emotions and biases like everybody else does. They try to check those and that it doesn't always work. Um, but absolutely, we reject stuff too early and uh, stuff gets uh, dismissed and then maybe brought back, maybe not brought back. That That certainly happens. The constraint always is that we don't have infinite money or infinite time or infinite energy, right? Like, so if I'm going to study every different impact hypothesis that someone proposes, we'll never get anything done. So I have to make a decision. Is this worth my time today or not? Is this worth our grant dollars today? Or should I put that money into this kind of cancer research or into this kind of astronomy or into this kind of whatever? Um, and those resource constraints, thinking of energy and time as also resources, those, um, those are real. And uh, it, a scientist could just take a week off and say, I'm going to complete. So you have this weird theory about, um, about why quantum theory isn't true. I'm going to take two weeks off of my schedule and just prove to you it's wrong. What you think is true. What you think is true is wrong and quantum mechanics actually works. You can do that. But uh, there are a lot of such people, and it would take a long time to do that for everybody. And we wouldn't have a productive scientific system doing other things at the same time. Whether one should let the public in on this, to a certain extent, they already are, in that congressional representatives scrutinize federal funding all the time. Um, every year, they make fun of certain grants that were given and they complain that other grants weren't given by the scientists. That's like a thing that Congress does. It's a nice piece of grandstanding. It makes for good, you know, uh, fundraising ads. Um, so we do have some degree of public input into the system, at least in this country we do. Um, but would it help to, sometimes the, the topics are too arcane, require too much math or too much specialized knowledge that you just can't. Um, bring someone in off the street and say, here, now you can help judge us, judge this question. Um, uh, at least that's the view that there are probably some topics where lay, lay person input would be really valuable. And there are others where it's not clear it would. And making that judgment is a political question. And maybe it's a political question that should be taken up. Do you think that maybe there should be better education in an actual and like schools, for instance, like, you know, grade school, you think that there should be like a topic or a conversation about pseudoscience and like, it seems a lot like critical thinking in a lot of aspects mm -hmm. as well. So at least from the knowledge that you have at the time, um, not really feeling with emotion, it seems like now there's more emotion being kind of forced with than thought in a lot of sense. Um, but I feel like if you teach pseudoscience or that type of thing at a younger age or identifiers on how to, hey, this is how we base actual physical science and this is just toilet Googling and you're not really paying attention. You know, I feel like that's a that's a very critical skill. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, I, I think that I, I'm all in favor of more and better science education. I think that, and I think that teaching um, the weird stuff uh, would help. I think it would be like, this. this is considered weird Here's why it's considered not compatible with the mainstream of knowledge that we have. 
And uh, this is how you could learn to spot those differences. I think that would be great. I don't think it would get rid of people proposing fringe theories because they, they don't think they're proposing incorrect theories. They have reasons why they think these theories are valid. People who believe the earth is flat have reasons why they think that's true. And they cite those reasons and you can argue with them about it. But it's not like they think they're putting forward false arguments. Uh, they think they're putting forward true arguments. So education won't fix it. It will just, it's like whack-a-mole. It will move <laughs> which things people propose to different areas. Yeah. You could maybe totally get rid of flat earth theory, but maybe you'll have a couple more ESP people as a result. Like, it, it, I don't think it will um, end the problem, but it's always good to have better education. I think like that, that's, a, that's a good thing. Do you think this is just human evolution and trying to understand what everything is? It seems like everyone has their own kind of cusp or road in a way, and it seems like everyone's they're on the they're all on paths. But the same end goal is, I guess, the inevitable death. But it seems like everyone's got their own idea of how to get there. Like some people are taking a car, some people are taking an SUV, one person's taking a bike, and another person's taking roller skates. It's like they're all not really wrong. They're all heading towards the same goal, but it's there's not a there there's a very very impactful thing when you label someone as a pseudoscientist or as a fringe theorist. It's just like, it feels like when your parents tell you you're grounded, not even grounded, that I'm disappointed in you. Whether you know that person or not, it's just a consensus of, of that person's idea that your idea isn't worth their time or isn't being validated. So, I mean, just, I'm not trying to get deep here. I'm just saying through the idea of this topic in general, I start looking at things like there's got to be a way where even if you it's like whack-a-mole and you hit someone down and they go over to another direction or, or you get a bunch of people, you have them all still lumped together rather than spread out individually. So you're able to focus on the inherent teachings of a certain issue and be able to come to a general consensus. And even if you can't come to a consensus, a just open communicational platform. I, I actually think that that, um, that would be good. Uh, it's again, keeping in mind that people have limited time and energy and so on, like all and they like things. to fight and drink. Yeah. And some people, like people, and some people want to be, want to disagree all the time. And that would, be, but I think that there is the impulse that makes people adhere to theories that other people label as fringe is the same as the impulse that makes people adhere to theories that other people label as mainstream. It's like, I want to understand the world. I'm using, uh, the tools I have available to me to try and do that. And I'm trying to be critical about the evidence I get. So that, that impulse is the same. And if there's a way of uh, directing people so that it's a more productive interchange as opposed to always hostile, that would be great. As for whether people, how it, it demonizes and makes people feel isolated and confined, I, I don't like that either. I think fringe is nicer than pseudo because it, yeah, it sort it of does recognize... Um, it recognizes that what you're doing is actually critical scientific thinking. It's just not accepted. And maybe there are good reasons for that. Maybe there are not good reasons for that. Um, but uh, the there are certain fringe doctrines that um, cause public harm. Like um, that if you adhere to, like tobacco smoking is totally fine for you. It does not cause any any illnesses a view that was promoted, and there are many scientific articles you can find which say that that's true, paid for by the tobacco industry, that's, um, that causes a public health problem, that, that that body of information is there. That, to my mind, is, should be treated differently than the Loch Ness Monster, where like, if people believe in the Loch Ness Monster, nobody dies, um, nothing bad happens. Um, and I think a less demonizing attitude towards people who disagree with mainstream science and adhere to the fringe and finding which areas are the ones that are actually matters of public concern and which are matters of private belief and can we separate those out 
I think that that is a more productive way of thinking about things. Where do you think it went wrong? Like, it just seems like a lot of this is a trust issue. It seems like a lot of the time, the evidence, whether studies were blended, for instance, uh, the sugar industry, they paid scientists like $50,000 to tell people that that's bad for you. It's not sugar. Mm -hmm. And they end up coming out with real studies and finding out that, no, they were paid off. It's actually sugar that's bad for you. And now you have a bunch of whole generations of kids growing up looking at the calorie content. And they're checking the fat to make sure they're not consuming fat. I mean, mm -hmm. not even when I was 10 years old, 11 years old, there was Adkins diet trends. There were all these types yeah. of things that people called pseudoscience or called them, I would call them that. Um, but it, you get to this point where it's like a lot of this seems like it's a trust issue as well too. a lot of people looking for direction. It's hard to be able to find the proper evidence, depending on if there's an outside force that's blocking you from seeing the true answer. I think, I think you're, you're, you're totally trust is actually at the bedrock of all of this. And this is something that people in my field, people who study science in general point out like regular science all the time relies on trust, right? Like you, probably haven't been at the telescopes to like find it, evidence of the big bang or to know anything about the composition of jupiter or um you haven't done the the assays to figure out that dna is actually real like i haven't done that either um i trust that the information i'm getting about that is reliable and i have ways of trying to check to see oh it's reliable because it's consistent with these other things that i do know or it's reliable because it's coming from a trusted source, or it's like, and so on. You have a bunch of ways of, but you have to trust at some level because nobody can do all the work themselves. You have to rely on other people to help you fill the picture out. That means that when trust gets fractured, a whole lot of things break down. Um, and if you don't trust that the, the scientists are not bribed, uh, you end up with a very serious problem. If you don't trust that the journals are publishing rely uh, information that's as reliable as they think it can be, you end up with another problem. If there's fraud, that produces another fracturing of trust. And then the whole system just doesn't work very well. Um, some of the issue is money. Uh, it's expensive to do science. People need to be funded. And, and then another set of issues are people's individual ethics. Another set of issues are there's just so much science being done. The scale, even compared to 50 years ago, the scale being done is just huge. It's constantly growing. It's very hard to keep on top of it all. So a lot of stuff that's not good makes it into the ecosystem because it's very hard to vet everything. All of those things add up to a situation which is fraught. And maybe there are ways we could try to fix parts of it to make it better. Do you think open science, like for me, when I hear that word, I honestly think fringe theory, like it just seems like, yeah, there's open science hashtags and people are out there wanting to give information like yourself, educating me mm -hmm. and educating my audience. But also it's like with the true data, when it comes to something serious or a scientific discovery of some sort, a lot of that starts becoming a moral decision as well, too, of what people choose to show. And that does label down with science and researchers being honest and I guess ethical mm -hmm. in a sense. But man, the amount of research, like if we bring it to like, um, I hate to go down this dark hole, but you mentioned the word before, but Nazis, for instance, the Nuremberg mm -hmm. trials, they did research and we forgave a lot of those Nazis as well too, because we wanted to use their data. So I'm like, they were, it, it's, it's, it was, it sounds horrible, but in a sense, they already did the work. They did the horrible act. There's no reversing that, but the best thing you can do is recover the research from it. Now there's people that'll say they want that research burned. There's people that'll say that this and this, but it doesn't erase what happened. So can we use it? Like our whole space program, a lot of that is like Nazi invention. I mean, Warner von Braun was the leader of our space program as well, too. Yeah. So, uh, well, and the Soviet and the American space programs both started with Nazi rockets. Like that's the the starting point Operation Paperclip. Yep, and they had their own called the spe the, the, the the specialists, uh, where they they grabbed people and brought them over there. I just pictured um, black gloves when you said specialists. I was like, that's exactly. <laughs> um. So. Uh, the the there's two i actually raised this question with my students to get them to discuss the issue of ethics and data a lot like yes on the one hand the the sort of the war crime has been done like you've tortured these people and gotten this data can we still use the data i mean like the people are 
the people are the crime has happened. Those people who have done it have been punished. Let's hope. But then we have the information. What do we do with it? On the one hand, you could say what you said, which is like it's here. Uh, we're not going to undo it by not using it, but maybe it could save some lives or help advance knowledge if we took it on. On the other hand, you might say someone who would torture somebody to get data probably made a whole bunch of other epistemological mistakes. A whole bunch of other issues are going on with their fact-finding process. So the data is tainted in a lot of ways, an ethical way, and other ways we maybe can't figure out yet. So maybe best to just quarantine that data over here and not rely on it. Uh, people can disagree about this. I think it would depend on what the data is and how important it is and whether we can't get that information some other way. Um, I would think if it's a huge ethical kind of data like source, I would say I would go, he's probably not lying about what he did. You know what I mean? Like, it just seems like, especially like you ever heard of unit 731, like yeah. those, those experiments that they did, you're just looking at it. Like, I mean, they can't, if it's something like the Stanford prison experiment, I get it. That's pseudoscience because you can, honestly, I thought it was a pretty good experiment, but it's, I mean, it's, it's be easily manipulable because everyone knew that they were in a study. And that's the whole point of a study is to have a study without people knowing that they're involved in it as well, too. So your data is kind of blended in a sense. But if we get to a point where it's something unethical, someone being forced against their will, that data is probably the most trustworthy because who's going to blend the details of a certain study that's that heinous if they're willing to do that act? Yeah, you're right. You're right in the sense that it's uh, the cognitive biases that come with uh, people, especially in psychological experiments, intervening and reinterpreting the data, that doesn't happen. But maybe the person, a person who would do that isn't especially good about controls. Um, cause they're like, oh, they're, they're all Jews. I'm going to torture anyway. So why should I bother setting up a control group? Like if that's the Nazi mentality that's working there, um, maybe we can't trust any of the data. Maybe we just don't think this person was objective enough to try and do the data gathering properly. In those cases, you just want to look. You want to you want to actually reconstruct what the knowledge was at the time and see how they did it to decide whether it's reliable or not. And then there's a separate question of the ethics, which um, if you think that the ethic you should never use unethically gathered data anyway, then that question's resolved in advance. But I think even if you think we could use ethically compromised data, you'd still want to make sure that it holds up to the usual rigor we would expect of somebody who doesn't commit war crimes. Yeah, it seems like a lot of what science, like now that we're starting to talk deeper into it, looks like it's on the concept of morality as well too. Mm -hmm. Like you wanna advance the human species with evidence and scientific stuff, but imagine if the act is so horrible, you just don't have the stomach to be able to get through something like that. Like even with animal experimentation, like there are some, like you see a cute puppy or you see one of those uh, little, uh, what are those, the sugar mouses, the little small little things. Yeah. It's like, oh, I can't do anything like that. It's like, well, then you're losing scientific data in a sense. Yeah, it might be an animal compared to a person, but at the same time, it's like people will have different biases on that too, where start looking at like the progression of the human species as on the basis of morality and depending on how that person experienced life or has gotten to the point that they're at, good or bad, the morality is different. So then you get different science. Imagine an alternate timeline where I have an Afro. And we're just, in a, you know, it's a whole different yeah, life experience. Uh, you know, one could look for alternative science. If you go back about uh, 1500 years and compare European science to Chinese science, they actually function very differently and have very different assumptions about how they work. And there's basically no communication between them. So we did have two very different sciences functioning at the same time, which is in itself kind of interesting. Um, but uh, about like now in many countries, increasing numbers of countries, it's illegal to do uh, invasive experiments on great apes, uh, chimps, bonobos, gorillas, orangs, like you, in gibbons, depending on how you define things. In general, I'm kind of in favor of those bans. I mean, like we can get the knowledge in other ways other than the ways we used to do it. Or in the 19th century, starting in Britain, the practice of vivisection was pr protested and largely stopped. Like, don't dissect this horse while it's still alive or while it's awake. 
Like, don't, don't, you, that's needlessly cruel. You can get the information some other way. And there's some information we can't get any other way, but there's a lot that we can. And so a lot of the moral pressure, I think, has pushed people to be inventive about how to extract knowledge from nature in ways that are kind of less soul crushing. Um, and we can't always do it, but sometimes we can. And uh, it seems like the less suffering we induce, the better. I feel like a lot of it goes on still now. There was just that article about the the, the truck that crashed with a bunch of human heads in the back that they were donated. The bodies were donated to science, but they just had the heads. Mm -hmm. And it was like people saw that openly in the public. And I don't think anybody yeah. really pays attention to like, oh, I'm going to be driving behind a Krispy Kreme truck and then the <laughs> back of it. Nobody thinks about that, but it's going on because this is how they get their evidence in science. So it's really but interesting to see like I like to know the like that type of stuff to me. That's horrible. But at the same time, it's like these pe people willingly did that. Like donated yeah. their body and, and, to science. And, and, and if you didn't donate your body to science, our 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 physicians would be way less well trained, right? Like they have to learn what a you could make a fake body. It's that moral but it won't be question, as good. dude. It's that it's not moral as good, question. right? Like, I know. Mythbusters um, is better when they use real people. <laughs> so this is uh, there are there are one of the things that I find fascinating about science is just it, it's. When I was a kid, I, I, I was taught, like I think many people were, that science is this kind of separate domain where everything is always objective and clean and produces stable knowledge forever. And as you get older, you realize that, oh, well, science is changeable over time. And in fact, that's probably good. And that scientists are people and they have judgments and biases and, uh, and there are ethical questions tied up with all of this. Science is like a microcosm that holds the whole our whole social world in it, as well as being our portal into understanding the natural world. And that that's, um, as you say, like the more we talk about it, the more, the deeper you go, the more there is. It's like the perfect blend of perfect and imperfect. Yeah. Which the is perfect blend of perfect and imperfect. Yeah. Yeah. Which is interesting in its own because it's like you, you think science is definitive, but at the same time can also be changed and adapted. Mm -hmm. Usually it's for the better as well too, but people want to hop on the mistakes, which sucks because it's like, I don't like people using trust the science or open science hashtags. Cause I'm like you putting up a tweet and saying like, Hey guys, Pepsi is amazing. And then you put trust the science. I don't like that. That's just not, that's not, you're, you're abusing that word and it loses meaning mm -hmm. because there's people out there. And I really never had a respect for academics until I started doing the show. And then after my first episode and talking to more academics, I was like, Oh, like I was just a kid that didn't, get the right hand of the education system. But when you actually talk to people like yourself who are passionate about what they research and what they pursue, you start to realize a bigger grasp that a lot of the general public like myself has just been kind of given this broad slap of if you're going to college or you're not. And if you didn't make it to that door to college, you have a weird obscure view of science because the only time it's really ever talked about is when it's like going to the moon or something horrible that happens like during yeah. this whole pandemic everyone's been blaming science for everything i'm like well hang on a second let's <laughs> make sure it's not the actual science it's the people that are saying the science that's you know like fauci saying trust me i'm a i'm science i'm like i don't think so bro come on but the, but and, and partly that's misspeaking at different times right like in the beginning that wasn't how he talked in the beginning it was like ego bro. why we think yeah, ego. I mean, people have egos, right? Like egos are real, right? Like why would we expect our scientists not to have them? Um, in fact, uh, you could make a case that some scientists have more. I mean, it's like a, it, it, there is a sort of hubris, a sort of grandiosity in trying to understand nature. About open science, you mentioned it earlier, and I wanted to say like, there are things about open science that are imperfect, but there are other things that are um, kind of not just necessary, but also kind of great. So like, this I don't is open know. science. You're giving me this is open science. Yeah. But another kind of open science. Um, I don't know if you were in a certain part of the Northeast last May and June, but like we had billions upon billions of cicadas come out everywhere. Yeah. Okay. So it was pretty gross, but it's also something that only happens every 17 years. And uh there aren't there aren't that many cicada specialists in the world because you can only study them every 17 years. So um, to get the data of where are they, where are they moving to, are there more of them or fewer of them, you basically rely on people with smartphones to take pictures of cicadas. Like, like the only way we can get data is that. Or earthquakes 
happen where they happen. We can't predict them. You need people on the ground to tell you what the earthquake felt like where they were so that you can start to understand a little bit about where the damage was and how the waves moved. Now we got better instruments, so it's a little easier. But in the 19th century, you just had to go to the village and say, like, where did it start? Did it start on, did it come from the east or from the west? Um, so you need uh, open input into science in many cases because the data can't be gotten any other way. Can and that's someone- actually... Great. It, can you imagine someone tweeting in the middle of an earthquake? Like they're going to hype it up way more than it is. So you got to like, it's like kind of like when someone says, oh, I've lost like 50 pounds. You go, okay, well, they're adding like 20 onto the actual number. So they lost yeah. 30. And it's like, that's what you have to do with people in an earthquake. It's like my whole yeah. house shook. Okay. Whole house shook. Did pictures fall off? They're saying they're, oh, a door fell. Okay. Let's take that. It's probably like a four or five. So what they used to do is like send out questionnaires and be like, uh, so did your house shake a lot, a little? On a scale like, of one to ten. Like, and the thing is, much of that data is pretty consistent. Like it's like it's it, most people seem to converge on certain numbers. Now maybe they're all exaggerating in the same direction, but it's kind of interesting what the results are when you actually do it. There's always some outliers who say like I barely felt it or it was tremendous. But people, um, especially if they think they're helping in some way try to be as accurate as possible. But the open science stuff is still in many ways an open question, right? There's lots of ways of trying to get more information out there and to bring more data in. Some of those are going to continue to be great and productive and some of them aren't. And uh, we're gonna, it's a process the same way science is. We're still learning and experimenting and moving ahead. All right, I just got one last question for you because then we'll wrap it up. Citizen scientist, yay or nay? Uh, qualified yay. Uh, so like, uh, citizen science for some things like the water, I think, I think the water in my, in my well is polluted and this, the city won't come out and check and I'm going to do the experiment or I'm going to try and source the information myself. That stuff's valuable. And that stuff is important because of a failure of governance. It like helps people move ahead. Some of it isn't great. Uh, but, uh, to some degree, uh, we get better information, better data. And to another degree, and I think this is the more, the bigger part of the qualified EA is, uh, participation in science is a way of people valuing science and being part of the project. And that's, I think, a healthy thing for a society to have thinking that we should all be connected in some way. Does it produce a lot of junk? Yes. Um, but I get Can't you. get rid of all of it. I agree with you too. Just NASA tosses out the word citizen scientist, like participation trophies. I'm like, bro, chill. He just told you like, Hey, you guys put, didn't put a period after your sentence. That's it. Like yeah. that's not a citizen. But, 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 it, but when Sputnik was launched by the Soviets, uh, tons of people went out with their telescopes into their backyard to like track its path. And that's the data we got, right? We didn't have radar stations set up everywhere. So like that was citizen science in a particular way. And uh, that was pretty great. But yeah, it, the term gets inflated, uh, deflated, I guess, by being inflated so much, it uses a lot of its, loses a lot of its value. Well, Michael, I appreciate you giving me your time, man. Is there a place where people can find you, your website, your Twitter? Do you have any links like uh, that? Uh, my Twitter is at Gordon Michael. Gordon is spelled with an I. Uh, so you can find me there. And that uh, has a link, I believe, to my website, which is just michaelgordon.com, which has articles I've written and uh, links to other things. And I'll link it all in the description for people listening. Thanks for listening to this episode. Out of the blind.